Hello and welcome to the program. I am Ama Marcus. Today marks a somber milestone. One year since the conflict between Israel and Hamas began. Well, the violence erupted unexpectedly last year on the 7th of October when Hamas launched a surprise attack during a major Jewish holiday, firing thousands of rockets and sending fighters into Israeli towns near the Gaza Strip. Well, on the eve of this anniversary, evil Israel ramped up its airstrikes on Gaza and Lebanon. Well, the skies above Beirut were lit up by fireballs and explosions. Now that is a grim reminder of the ongoing violence. As of today, nearly 100 Israeli hostages remain in Gaza, with less than 70% believed to be alive. Well, Israel's military also announced that 726 of its soldiers have been killed in the past year, including 380 in the last year's attack and 346 in subsequent fighting. Well, the Gaza Health Ministry on its part reports over 41,000 Palestinian deaths since the conflict began, although the figures did not specify how many were fighters or civilians. Well, on the show this afternoon, we have Mr. Matthew O'Malley. He is an international relations specialist. Welcome to the show, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. All right, so let's start with Israel now. So Israel has argued, you know, on its part that uh, the one-year military campaign in Gaza is, which has now spilled into Lebanon, is in line with its rights to protect itself from aggression. Well, looking at the death toll right now, which stands at 41,000, according to the Palestinian Health Authority, is that right still justified? Well, um, Hamas is still holding on to hostages. And um, the issues that are in dispute have largely not been resolved. Hamas continues to pose a major threat to Israel. Israel is fighting for her existence. And therefore, you cannot wholesale fault their military action against those who wants to wipe them from the face of the earth. That is just the basic truth. Um, Israel was provoked by the events of October 7th last year. Everything was going on very well. Negotiations were going on with Saudi Arabia and several of the Arab countries. And then all of a sudden, Israel was attacked losing almost 1,500 of her citizens in a brutal attack by Hamas. Israel makes it a point that it's not fighting the Palestinians, it's not fighting against um, the Arab world. It's purely targeting Hamas and the proxies of Iran. So when you, when you look at the activities of Iranian-backed terrorist organization. If you look at the activity, it's really worrisome because Hamas slogan is dead to Israel. That is their slogan. And um, this hard stance of Hamas has led to the current of prevails in the Middle East. Um, how it is going to end, nobody knows. But I listened to uh, President Netanyahu. He has consistently said that once the Israeli hostages, about 100 of them that are left, either dead or alive, once they are released, then there will be ceasefire. That has not been done. Mm. And um, the ca I agree with you. The casualty figure is high. 41,000 is really very, very high. But again, According to the Israelis, the hostages, uh, the, the, according to the Israelis, the Hamas have been using their citizens as human shield. Most of the people killed were killed in the cross in the crossfire. I don't want to. I am not. I'm not trying to defend Israel, but I know that the Israeli has claimed that most of those that have been killed where those that have been either their, 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 their residences are being used by Hamas to attack the Israelis or tunnel shafts have been dug beneath such buildings. Um, 
you know this war is not a physical war where you are fighting with non-army it's like a guerrilla warfare mm. and um, hamas are mixed with the civilian population so definitely the casualty will be very very high mm. uh, to when a military operation of this nature is being held in fact there was um, one of the dead hostages or some of the released hostages were being held in residential buildings in people's homes uh, so that shows you that um, this war is not the normal conventional war that we know between two military you are you, what you have on your hand you have gorillas you have um, faceless people you have people disguised and mixing with the civilians and that is why the casualty is very high mm. but israel has assured that they have been doing all within their powers to ensure that um, the casualty figure is low now if you look at if it were not the iron dome and the the uh, the uh, david sling yeah when hezbollah fires their rocket they don't know wherever the rocket is going to land so if israel has not gotten this defense system probably the casualty even on the side of israel would have been high don't forget that when the attack of october 7 happened homes were attacked civilians were slaughtered innocent people families were also slaughtered so uh, it's a tit for tat uh, situation which the world has been condemning and everybody is saying there need to be ceasefire but how will there be a ceasefire when hostages are still being held that is the major question mm. yeah so on the usually front now we're seeing you know it's kind of divided in the early days of the war we saw massive support for the administration of prime minister netanyahu where people were advocating that the war continues but with this staggering death toll and with the you know humanitarian crisis that has developed in the country in the gaza strip right now it's kind of divided so while there are some protests people are protesting against the war in gaza some people are advocating for it and of course earlier uh, sometime early this year they had called for elections with uh, which the prime minister had said would not hold until that has happened so with a divided front now you know going forward as this year marks its one year anniversary are we looking at more support for the prime minister's government not forgetting that the icc had issued an arrest warrant against him not just against him though but also for hamas's leader so with all of these you know combating the government of prime minister benjamin netanyahu are we looking at massive support from the home front or is this something we'd have to weather on its own don't be deceived by the internal protests in israel the israelis are united as far as this war and the issue on ground the issue of the, the crisis in the middle east is concerned the people that are protesting mainly are families of hostages mm. those protests are aimed at putting pressure on the Israeli government to ensure that the hostages are released alive. And they are putting pressure on the Israeli government to um, enter into some form of negotiation and agreement with the Hamas to ensure that their family members come back alive. I think that is the basis of the protest. The protest is not against Israel retaliation for what has been done to Israel. The protest is basically not against um, uh, Net Netanyahu's um, uh, strive to, 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 to ensure the safety and security of the Israelis. So um, having said that, yes, just like every other country, issues of governance, issues of um, um, elections and so on have always been very contentious. But these are basically internal affairs of Israel. I don't subscribe to the view that Netanyahu is prolonging the war because he wants to hold on to power. I, am, I, I don't think so. Um, if you know the history of Netanyahu, you will know that he is one of the hawks among the hawks in the Israeli system. Uh, that what they want is total Zionist control 
of the entire um, uh, Palestinian territory. Uh, so um, it's just unfortunate that it has happened this way. And since it has happened this way, Israel is facing an existential threat. And it is in their interest for all of them, all hands to be on deck to support the government so that they can overcome what has happened. Um, on the other hand, um, you cannot be talking about an election when you are faced with the uh, when you are faced with a situation whereby 200 missiles are fired at you from Iran. You cannot be talking about internal election matters mm. when you are being attacked at different fronts. You are being attacked from Lebanon. You are being attacked from um, from 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 Gaza. You are being attacked even from the Houthis from the sea. So uh, any Israeli who is uh, uh, opposing Netanyahu now uh, should get his or her head examined as far as I'm concerned because the threats are, are potent. That is not to say that I think some of those agitating, I think their feeling is that Netanyahu would have handled the war better. I think some of those protesting are saying, why will you even allow October 7 to happen in the first place? Mm. It was a failure of intelligence and security. Why would you allow your enemy under your watch to penetrate your border, penetrate your security, and unleash that type of mayhem on your people. Do you understand? Yeah. So some people are rightly are calling for Netanyahu's head because sincerely speaking, I'm one of those that were shocked that that could happen yeah. in the Israel of the, with all the security system, with all the advanced technology, advanced technology that they and how this thing passed through and uh, happened without any trace. Mm. It calls to question there's a serious failure of intelligence and uh, some of those agitating that is their reason and I quite agree with them. There's no explanation. Mm. There's nothing Netanyahu and his cabinet would tell anybody that that would have led to that type of onslaught. But it has happened. <laughs> what the Israeli should know is that it has happened. And if it has happened is for them to reorganize themselves and see how it can never happen again. And that is one of the points that the Israeli government is saying, that they want to degrade Hamas as much as possible. They want to degrade Hezbollah as much as possible. They want to degrade the Houthis as much as possible. So that they, in the next, in the few years ahead, they will not have the capacity to strike hmm. Israel. Okay. So it's for their for their own self defense. So, Mr. Omale, earlier you mentioned Iran, and we have seen that this uh, this conflict has now gotten into the wider Middle East region. It started in Gaza. Mm. Now we're seeing strikes, exchange of strikes between Israel and Lebanon, mm. and we're seeing Iran also being roped into this issue as well. As you know, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard have also received strikes on their end. So we're looking at allies bound together, and of course, the United States on its part is also supporting israel despite you know resistance from its own congress and of course uh, the british government initially they supported israel but now they are calling for an arms embargo you know on weapons that are being delivered to israel same thing with the house of congress in the united states so with this conflict moving wider and wider are we looking at a sustained conflict or is this something that the allies can come together and force both parties to sit at the negotiation table for a very long time from the, uh, Jimmy Carter in 1980, where the Camp David Accord was reached, to the Oslo Accord, to the various peace meetings that have been called to resolve the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict. So it has been a long-term uh, effort uh, to, to, to create peace. But um, I want to tell you that America will always stand, America and the West, Forget what the UK is talking, forget what Fr France is talking about. They are allies to the Israelis. They could disagree in terms of strategy and tactics. They could disagree. But when the chips are down, 
they are not going to abandon the Israelis. I think why the U.S. Congress and all the countries you mentioned, why they are talking about, why they are talking about resolution of this conflict is that nobody wants a third world war. Nobody wants a third world war, and that's why they want to put all their efforts to resolve this conflict because it will be too catastrophic and devastating to the entire world. Even the Iranians themselves, mm. they don't want an all-out war. The implication of a, a world war now to the global system will be too catastrophic with the level of military arsenal, nuclear bombs, and, and so, uh, biological weapons and all kinds of uh, ammunition that have, been, that have been produced or that is in the pipeline to be produced. Going to an all scale full war amongst both the allies and even Iran and her proxy will leave a, a monumental devastating consequence in the in the world. In fact, some religious people have even said it will lead to the end of the world. Oh my. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my. So everybody is trying to see what can be done to avoid this conflict. But mm. the solution to the conflict is very simple. And that is why everybody is pushing for a ceasefire, including the United Arab Emirates, Qatar. Everybody is working towards having a ceasefire. Uh, having a ceasefire is very critical. It was almost achieved, but because of some little nitty-gritty, yeah. it, it collapsed. In the terms, yeah. Yes, and especially that um, Hezbollah was dragged in. Israel cannot watch. Hezbollah has shot thousands of rockets at Israel from the southern flank. Hmm. But Israel delayed a bit because they were not ready to open too much um, battle fronts. So they concentrated on Hamas in Gaza and then uh, after they felt sufficiently that they have degraded um, Hamas, then they now face the Hezbollah on the other side. Um, Israel has att attained in the last one year they have attained significant progress. The leader of Hamas, Ishmael Haniyeh, was taken out, yeah. even on Iranian soil. Most of the top commanders of Hamas had been eliminated. Yeah. Mohammed Def. We don't know the whereabouts of uh, Yahya Sinwa. Mm. And so um, Hamas basically has been, um, has been de decimated. I don't see them surviving after this war. Don't forget that just like Israel, you said that Israel is facing internal insurrection. Yeah. Hamas too is facing internal insurrection because some Palestinians, Israel, the Palestinian Liberation Organization that is headed by Mahmoud Abbas. Yeah. The, 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 the Hamas is, is, is their enemy. So they, 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 are not, they are not working together. So um, in, in international conflict of this nature, there are several dimensions. Just like there are internal insur insurrection within Israel, they are also, um, the Hamas, the, the Palestinians, are not also as cohesive as they should be. And again, with the influence of, external influence of Iran, you know, who is bankrolling and giving all the yeah. military equipment and so on. So it, 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 that makes the uh, conflict very difficult. You are not dealing with sovereign entities. Hamas is basically not a sovereign entity. It's just like a political party within the Palestinian state. We have the Fatah, we have um, the PLO, Palestinian Organization. On the other front, we have the Hezbollah, we have the government. Yeah. The Hezbollah is just like an association within, yeah. within Lebanon. The Lebanon army says they are not part of the conflict. That it is Hezbollah, which is an organization. And if you see, the Hassan Nasrallah was taken out. The man who succeeded him was also taken out. Yeah. There have been a lot of um, the the entire the entire um, lead, top leadership of Hezbollah has been decimated. Then look at the pager attack. Yeah, the pager attack. Yes, look at the pager that shows you the resolve of the Israelis. They want to get to the bottom of this crisis. And yeah. I tell you. By the time Hamas and Hezbollah are decimated in Lebanon and in Gaza, the citizens will rejoice. Because it's not as if the people of Lebanon 
people, nor the people of Gaza. Gaza. It's not as if they, 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 they are wholeheartedly in support of what Hamas has, has done, done, or the type of um, the type of um, uh, calamity they have brought on themselves. Because at a point, there were a lot of progress has been made toward the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. But I think one of the reasons for the October 7 attack was to truncate the peace move between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Mm. Yes, it was basically to truncate it and to also make the uh, conflict intractable. Hamas do not want an independent state of Israel in that region. Oh, yes, because I was getting there. You know, initially in the early stages of the war, they were pushing for a two-state solution. Yes. You know, so, but it seems that, that is, we're deviating away from that you know, two-state solution that they were pushing for. We can't avoid that. Oh, dear. If you say you don't want a Palestinian state, it's not practicable any longer. The entire world is calling for Palestine to be independent. I support that, too. There's no, there's no reason why you can say that the Palestinians should not have their own state at this point in time. Mm. So also, you cannot say the Israeli state that was created in 1948 after the Second World War should just be uh, obliterated and <laughs> it's not possible. Mm. So um, I agree with the advocates of a two-state solution. But saying that you want one of the parties to now pack their things and go to where? If you are pushing the Hamas, where are you pushing them to? If you are pushing the Palestinians, where are you pushing them to? If you are pushing the Israelis, where are you pushing them to? So there have to be a way that the two of them have to live together, respect each other in line with international, uh, international principles. Mm. Speaking of international principles, and of course you mentioned the Arab League earlier, mm -hmm. international organizations are calling for an end to the war. And of course the United Nations has been chief among them. We're seeing advocates from different countries. Mm -hmm. Even South Africa is taking the lead, uh, pushing a genocide case against Israel at the ICC. Mm -hmm. The international organizations are pushing, but we're not seeing a lot of, you know, resolve. To the, so how important is the international community in this? And are they as influential as they seem to be? <laughs> the United Nations, as it is presently, is just like a toothless bulldog. Oh dear. Yes. I remember hearing that uh, in international law, for yes. the, but that was for the World Court, the ICC. We yes. called it toothless bulldog then. Yes. The, there have been several resolutions of the United Nations calling for a ceasefire. None of those resolutions have come to light principally because America has veto power when you, the Security Council takes a resolution. All the resolutions that have been taken on this current conflict now was vetoed by the United States, including the resolution on ceasefire. Hmm. So when you have a United Nations that is organized in that format, then you cannot be talking about the United Nations being very proactive. But again, the United Nations has moral sanction. I think the United Nations have tried a lot to regulate um, the activities of all the parties in the conflict. But it is handicapped by institutional mechanisms that do not allow it to just go in and deploy peacekeeping forces and so on. Like I told you, all the permanent members of the Security Council have to agree before such intervention can take place. But the interest is so huge, even among members of the Security Council, the principal uh, people that can take this decision. At the floor of the General Assembly, yes, you could. The General Assembly is, is, is a bit powerless because yeah. the major power is with the Security, Security Council. Security Council, yeah. So it's very powerless. Even you talked about the ICJ. The Tejavo cannot be arrested when the countries that have the bit of power and control of even the ICJ um, um, are backing him. Exactly. Because... So, Sorry to cut you, because I saw, um, you know, Netanyahu, normally if you leave your country, countries, other countries are, you know, for example, he went to the United Nations General Assembly, which mm. happened in New York mm. a few weeks ago. 
as according to law, it's expected that you know the the government of you know the United States would bundle him and hand him over to the ICC because he's now out of his country. Why but we you, didn't see that happen. Why will and you, he was out of his country. Why will you bundle Netanyahu? Uh, what of Putin? Exactly. Putin. <laughs> I mean, the, the same thing is in, yeah. in, we can see that. So we almost see that the jurisdictions and the you know the things that are put out by the ICC it doesn't it's, it's not carried out and it's only being carried out against Afghan countries. But there's that bias when it comes to the allies of countries on the western side. Yes, that that is one of the major problems with um, international law as we see it today. The selective or uh, disrespect for international law. Hmm. You cannot say you cannot hold any one person. It's brazenly being done by everybody. So and that is where the issue of morality comes in. Uh, you, uh, Russia is a member of the Security Council. Look at what they are doing in Ukraine. <laughs> Look at Britain, Iran themselves. Most of the resolution taken, even the Lebanese resolution 1701 that was taken that said, "Look." The, the Hezbollah should be disbanded, they should, yeah. they should move into, they should allow the Lebanese security to take charge and so on. Has it been respected? No. Several resolutions that have been taken on Hamas, even designated, even a terrorist organization, have all those been followed. So there's a lot of uh, politics involved in this matter on every side, on all the sides. And that is why it makes the whole thing even more complex. But like I said, the world is not ready for any major, for after the COVID-19, for any other shock that mm. is going to come. We have too many problems in the world now that having another world war will not be, will not be desirable. Okay. So everything has to be done to put the this crisis to nip it in the board but the first move is to get the hostages released secondly allow the two-state solution the hamas have to agree that israel should survive also israel should also know that there's nothing they can do hamas uh, palestinians should also be able to have their independent statehood. With that, the crisis will be resolved. But the first way to go first is to have a ceasefire. Because once there's a ceasefire, tension will begin to cool down. Um, uh, things will begin to stabilize. And then they go to the negotiation table and discuss the nitty gritty of how the two state solution can be implemented. But first and foremost, the ceasefire has to be done. But what will, what will expressly lead to this ceasefire is if the 100 hostages that are still there are released by Hamas and um, sh the shooting of rockets by Hezbollah and other proxies into Israel seizes. I think with that, Israel can be prevailed upon to also shield their sword and then they can all go to the negotiation table to see how the state two-state solution can be implemented. Mr. O'Malley, it's been a pleasure having you on the show today. Oh, thank you We appreciate much. you for giving your updates on this current crisis. Mm. And we hope that we won't have to mark another year of the conflict. Hopefully. 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 Uh, because already everybody is wary. I know that Iran, Iran too, um, they will not want an all-state war, all-out war. Um, everybody should be tired of the conflict now. And like I said, once the hostages, the remaining hostages are released, I see no reason why they cannot go and sit on the table and arrive at it. Nobody wants to go. Let me tell you something about international negotiation. Okay. Nobody wants to go to the table from a position of weakness. Mm. Yes. Israel wants to ensure that by the time they are going to the negotiation table, the Hamas would have been so weakened that they would say yes. Whatever they say at the table, everybody will say yes. So and, if, and even Iran and um, the, 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 the and their proxies, they too, they want to so much inflict pain on Israel to the extent that by the time they go to the negotiation, just like you said, the Israelis are putting pressure. By the time they go to the negotiation table, 
everybody will be tired. So all wars at the end of the day. Second World War end on the negotiation table. First World War led to the peace of Westphalia. Yeah. Second World War, you know, like that. So that is the story of wars. Uh, wars will definitely, no matter how, no matter how long, at the end of the day, it will still lead to the negotiation table. Most of the changes in the world happened after the major war, even before the the, the 19th century. Yeah. Yeah, the 30 year old war in, in in Europe ended with the Peace of Westphalia, and and so every war must end on the negotiation table, and will lead to a drastic decisions that will be taken. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Male, thank you for joining the show today. We really appreciate you. Thank you very much. Okay. And it's my pleasure to be here. Okay, thank you. Mm. So you've been watching Global Digest, and of course we have been speaking with Mr. Martin Male. He is an international law expert, and we have been speaking with him as Israel marks one year of the conflict with Gaza. Well, we'll have more news and developments to come later in the show. Just stay with us. <laughs>